Yeah, check, check if it's working. Uh, since it just been, uh, keeps showing us a breath, I guess, or at least the uh, obesity, uh, couch, obesity, and 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 obesity, because it's you know, predominantly women who have been in executive space. Are you trying to make this even more comfortable? Exactly. This is this Hi. Hi, LL. What's the reason with this? It's like Kanye's system. Like no, Kim Kardashian's system. It's obscure. Kim Kardashian's system. It's pretty similar to Mr. Smith, if you've seen them. Oh, look, that's why you should just rename it. Like, well, can you just rename it? Yes, for 2017. Go there. Go there. <laughs> You missed any certain No, this is the most important. This is where you have she read it and she was rushy. She relaxed him. Yeah. Right, I think it's I think it's good. Yeah. You, you know you know so many versions like watch how his Oscars are like was Mac, was, Mac was actually doing was like a me. It's not the same. Oh, yeah. He's a friend anyway. He's a friend. He's a friend. Don't believe him. Hi, everyone. Uh, we might just get a, make a start so we can get out of here quickly. Uh, thanks again for coming. I know it's it's it's, it's, a, it's rare to go, uh, get a good turnout for our lectures. So thanks to everyone. And uh, I know when I was in third year, it was really difficult, especially since I was in Central. But yeah, thanks so much for coming. Um, I really appreciate this. We really appreciate it. Um, just to let you know, we didn't really get much time to prepare for this lecture, so um, I apologise if it's very brief and like low yield, but we'll try our best. Um, just as an introduction, so rest is a pretty important topic, probably just third after GIT and cardio, um, so it's pretty important to learn it well and learn the major conditions. So we, the format we've taken is just to go through all the major conditions for rest, and hopefully that will be helpful. Um, as for all things in third year, I'm not sure if you guys have heard this before, but it's more important to focus on diagnosis and investigations as opposed to management and pathophys of conditions. So yeah, we're just going to be mainly focusing on um, what you need to know at a third year level and not much beyond that. Um, without further ado, um, we'll get Rishur to take it away. All right. Thanks, Mac, for that introduction. And um, yeah, so thanks again for coming, everyone. We'll get started, I guess. If you have any... What was it? <laughs> Harassment. But if you have any questions, um, feel free to stop us at any part of this lecture. Otherwise, let's get going. So first case is of a 21-year-old man who presents with a wheeze and chest tightness. I guess it's not much. So what else would you like to know? I won't look at you if you give me the answers. I just stare at the screen, if that helps. When did it start? OK, when did it start? Um, relatively new onset, maybe two or three days ago, but it's getting worse and worse. Anything else you'd like to know? Where the wheeze is? Where the wheeze is? It's very chesty. 
Yeah. Um, so night time is usually a bit more difficult to navigate. It tends to come and go. Some would call it episodic. Um, okay, no, that's pretty good. Uh, so you notice on further history taking, there's also a cough. Ask for a cough, it's not the same thing. Um, the symptoms are episodic, whereas the night hand with exercise is a family history of atopic disorder. Is everyone comfortable with that term? Do we know what it sort of comprises of? So if you could just shout out, it keeps going, doesn't it? <laughs> Never mind, let's go. Um, on examination, there's a widespread high pitched musical wheezes and tripoding. So that's just a clinical feature you see on general inspection. So, what do you think is the most likely problem given everything? Asthma. So, it's an acute presentation of asthma. Um, what is asthma? So, this is one of the many definitions that you'll find on the internet. Uh, it's, it's a very common chronic condition, very common in Australia. Um, it's complex and you have this recurring nature to it. Uh, asthma as a disease is, I guess, of greater importance in children, but since you guys aren't covering pediatrics in year three, we'll stick to management in adults. The summary of um, pathophysiology, just remember it's a biphasic reaction. Everyone talks about it being a biphasic reaction. It just means there's a bronchial constriction followed by subsequent inflammation. And in atopic asthma, people always mention a T helper to an IgE mediated response. So these are things to get you buzzed, the things in red. If you see this, get buzzed. See it on an exam, get buzzed. Go for asthma. Um, don't get prematurely buzzed because that sort of puts down the wrong answer sometimes. Take your time, but get buzzed in the process. Um, eosinophils are key inflammatory cells, and you find them in almost all subtypes of asthma. Uh, what we haven't covered really are the various, various subtypes of asthma. And it depends who you ask. If you ask a pathologist, if you ask a pediatrician, or if you ask an adult respiratory um, specialist. So we won't really go into that. But um, for deeper learners, Kirschman spirals and charcoal laden crystals. And then Kirschman spirals are just mucus plugs containing worlds of like shed epithelium. And charcoal laden crystals are collections of crystalloid made up of eosinophilic proteins. Okay? So these are things that feature on like past tests or Pathy and Qs, if you do any of those books. So triggers. I won't really talk about risk factors. I guess the biggest risk factor is having a family history. Um, and then sort of, yeah, the ge genetic predisposition probably tends to be the biggest risk factor, but triggers are more relevant in asthma. So things like respiratory infections, cold air, cigarette smoking, um, beta blockers, and there's a very, very high association with gastroesophageal reflux or gastroesophageal reflux disease in patients with asthma. Um, external triggers are things like pollen, dust, animal power. One in nine Australians have asthma, so like I said, very common. And the age um, distribution is the age. So, so distribution by gender, by age group, is quite interesting because you notice this phenomenon where between the age groups of zero and fourteen, there's a preponderance in males, and then past the age of fourteen, female presentations tend to be more common. Um, and I must say that not all kids with asthma will go on to have chronic asthma in adulthood which might be, you know, the explanation for that statistic. Uh, the, rate, the rate is twice as common among Indigenous Australians and understandably high in areas with low SES and in people living in inner regional areas as opposed to metropolitan cities. Um, investigations, your pulmonary function tests will give you this obstructive picture. You can consider allergy testing if it seems to be a case of atopic asthma and chest x-rays are usually not indicated. Unless there's a very focal sign, then you might suspect cardiac involvement. Uh, in addition, you can always do arterial blood gases and peak flows at the bedside. Any questions so far? So this is a very aesthetic slide on diagnosing and treating asthma. Um, notice that this stepped approach applies to maintenance medication in adults and adolescents, so not pediatrics. Uh, on the right, is it? Yeah. On the right, um, that's an image. There's sort of like an algorithm how you approach your patient with asthma. Um, I'm not going to fixate on this slide too much. Just notice that management is very stepwise. You don't jump to the most potent therapy. You guys already have a very solid understanding of what this is. So, something else you can do 
or something you do in ED when someone comes in with asthma is a severity assessment because that dictates your immediate management. Um, and again, not going to delve into too much detail, but notice that wheezing is not really a very reliable indicator of how bad asthma is. It usually tends to be things like their mental state. Are they able to talk in complete sentences? Can they talk without pausing for breaths? So things like uh, their V's or pulses paradoxes, which is notoriously famous in AMQs, but not really something you see in anyone with severe asthma when you're working in ED. Those things are not very reliable. Um, but what if you're in the community, you're not in the hospital? What do you do then? Um, call an ambulance, that's a good... So you, see, you, you are not the ambulance in this instance, you're not in the hospital, right? So you actually have to call for help. Um, so do that first, advice to having a severe asthma attack. Um, and everyone talks about this 4x4x4 four by four by four asthma first aid plan, so ideally you'll have a spacer or a pressured meter dose inhaler, and the recommendation really is for salbutamol. It differs if you're using ephemetrol or something else, so you should look into that. ATG has more information, but it's four separate actuations with the spacer if you have one available. Um, four separate actuations, one at a time, and after each actuation you take four breaths from the spacer. Then you wait four minutes and you give another four separate actuation. So this keeps going and if it's not getting better, you um, call an ambulance. Or if you have done a preliminary assessment at the beginning and it's already severe, you call an ambulance straight away. But if it's like moderate or mild, then you do the four by four by four first. So the acute management of flare-ups, um, I guess it's, the, these are the cornerstones of management in adults at least. So you've got salbutamol, ibotropium and oxygen. Um, so people with mild to moderate um, disease, after your assessment, generally salbutamol will suffice. But if you've got severe disease, you might consider ipratropium, which is, in terms of mechanism of action, how does that work? How does salbutamol work? It's a SABA, right? So short-acting beta-2. Um, what about ipratropium? anti -muscarinic. yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> so life-threatening. If they're life-threatening, then you tick all these three boxes. So notice, despite all the words, what we're doing here is really ticking one box, ticking two boxes, and then ticking all three boxes, right? It's very simplistic. Asthma in itself is a very complicated disorder. It's very easy to get bogged down in your study. So I advise taking a generalized approach, knowing what the, step, the, the, the stepped approach is, and then going into further detail, learning about the colors of each of the puffers if you have the time, um, essential things include learning how to use a spacer or counseling a patient on how to use a spacer. And if you need help on that, I think the National Asthma Council or Foundation or whatever, um, they've got really good videos on that. Literally watched it the day before my OSCE and we had a station on it. So would advise doing the same, also, if not a couple of days before. Yeah, also learn like the, the what do you call those in heritage? Like powder? Yeah, powder. Oh, yeah. Turby Turby So you get in all exotic types of inhalers. But, Generally, it tends to be a pressured meter dose inhaler um, in combination with the spacer. It's not unreasonable to expect Medfac to throw that at you. So this is the second case. We have a 55-year-old man with sudden severe breathlessness and right side of pleuritic chest pain. Again, not enough. So what else would you like to know? Oh. Um, what else would you like to know, guys? Any recent trauma? Can't even remember what the case is. I'm going to say no. <laughs> How long are you the um, So this was, let's say, acute onset, a couple of hours. Is it getting worse? Yep, it seems to be getting worse. What was he doing at the time? Uh, not much, really. He doesn't remember. Um, no, so, no cough, <laughs> uh, but he is a bit breathless, as is mentioned. <laughs> what about the past medical history would you like to ask? Do you have COPD? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure, doctor. What is COPD? No, I, oh, yeah, actually, yeah. I used to be a smoker. Recent surgery. Good question. No, no surgery. 
Um, so we'll move on to other prompts on exam. You know there's a hyperinflated chest. Uh, breath sounds are reduced on the right. And there's a hyper resonance to percussion on the right. So you order a chest x-ray because who cares about the history? And then you notice this. So what are you seeing here? Or even without, like disregarding the chest x-ray, if you go back to this, what do you think his problem is? <laughs> okay, um, a pneumothorax. And can you all appreciate the pneumothorax in that? I'll give you two puts in the, in the, yeah, it's on the right side. And if you look hard enough, you can see a visible visceral fluid edge. Does that show up? So what I want you to appreciate is if you think of the lung like a leaf, notice how all of this is very lungy. That's a technical term. And then peripheral to that, it stops being as lungy. And radiologists call this radiolicency, so you can't see lung markings peripheral to that line or the plural line now that you've established. So this is a pneumothorax, and um, if you look even closer, you can see these sort of plebs at the bottom. So likely in someone, likely someone with bullous emphysema, given his extensive smoking history, his clinical features of hyperinflation. Is emphysema a clinical diagnosis? No. Good. It isn't. But chronic bronchitis tends to be. So we're guessing it's, you know, we can see them from, or I can't really, but radiologists would be able to tell you this is, this appears to be bullous emphysema. And he's got a secondary spontaneous right pneumothorax as a result. So pneumothorax will very quickly just refers to air in the plural space. Um, if this collection of air is continuously enlarging in its volume and compressing media sound structures due to a one way valve, that's called a tension pneumothorax. So in terms of classifying pneumothoraces, you've got spontaneous primary. So things that happen on their own, usually due to an underlying disorder like Marfan. So it's funny, but things that happen on their own, so I guess a direct force onto it. And then spontaneous secondary, typically in people with COPD. Um, and then traumatic iatrogenic, when you are the culprit. Clinical features include pleural chest pain, dyspnea, hyperexpanded hemithorax, um, and the hyperresonance to percussion. And attention pneumothorax is characterized by, I guess, rapid deterioration, very, very rapid deterioration. And obviously, meter sound shift would be a red flag on an EMQ. Management um, the basics are oxygen analgesia. And then you can go for a 14 gauge IV catheter. The second intercostal space, again, get bust, mid clavicular line, or you can do a tube thoracostomy at the fifth ICS mid axillary line. Um, pleurodesis, if this, if this person has recurrent pneumothoraces or pleural effusions. Uh, do you guys know what a pleurodesis is? You basically stick the pleura together. So if they're having pleural effusions or they're having pneumothorax, you stop it by sticking the visceral and parietal pleura together, usually with something like pleomycin or talc. Radiographic findings, and this is important because, um, again, it's not unreasonable to anticipate a case of pneumothorax for an OSCE. Usually, like I talked about, you can see that visible visceral pleural edge, and then that radiolucency, so the darkness of the peripheral space. Uh, you might also get subcutaneous emphysema and pneumomediastinum. And then mediastinal shift with obviously the... Um, I think the picture in the middle, that's the deep sulcus sign, so... You might say there's patchy consolidation, but really there's no overt evidence of the pneumothorax, apart from the fact that on the right side, um, the costophrenic recess is, seems to be pulled down a lot compared to the other side. So that might be a very, very subtle presentation of the pneumothorax. Okay. And on that same note, well, don't we talk about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? So this is a common and progressive disorder, and um, what differentiates it from things like asthma is you don't have that reversibility component to it. Um, in day-to-day -day use, it includes things like chronic bronchitis and emphysema. So for third year level, COPD equals chronic bronchitis plus emphysema. And the clinical features are conveniently illustrated in that comic, so I don't have to talk you through it. 
Uh, it's worth mentioning the types of emphysema simply because it ties in with your pathology learning. There's a central lobular emphysema that's, you know, typically seen in smokers. Um, there's a panlobular type that's seen in alpha one antitrypsin deficiency. There's a paraseptal type, young adults typically causing spontaneous pneumothorax. And in, uh, there's something called an irregular pneumothorax where but the majority of them are asymptomatic, and this might be the most common subtype in the community. But you never pick it up because it's usually secondary to a scarring process, a chronic inflammatory scarring process. Cool. So if I tell you alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and ask you to write an EMQ for it, what would you put in there? Yeah, that's a good start. Liver problems. Liver problems. So what organ systems can be affected? We know for a fact the lung scan. <laughs> the liver can. <laughs> Any other pivotal organ systems? So we've got problems with the... Oh, never mind. <laughs> we'll come back to that, perhaps. Um, we might have some EMQs on it. If not, we'll, pass, we'll mention it in passing at the end. So investigations in COPD, you might get um, an increased packed cell volume. So it's sort of a reactionary polycythemia because of the hypoxemia that they're suffering from. Um, arterial blood gases, you can do it if you want to. Uh, you're looking at PO2, and they might or might, might not have hypercapnia. Uh, what do you appreciate about this X-ray? That's it, yeah, literally that. So <laughs> if you see this, I mean, the gross abnormality here is hyperinflation, think COPD right away. And you can get all these other signs as well. So uh, can you appreciate the stretched vertical heart, how the cardiac borders don't seem to be as significant? So management, brace yourselves. The RACGP and a couple of other societies came up with this COPDX. It's an acronym they had to work very hard to put together. And the C stands for confirm, uh, case finding and confirm diagnosis. OK? And they have this, they've published this entire booklet because it's a very chronic process, right? There's not much you can do about it. So if you're going to be a general practitioner or a respiratory specialist, you'll have to go through this actual booklet. But at your level, just know that this exists. So and maybe a few other facts, like on a pulmonary function test, when you look at the FEV1 or FVC ratio, you'd expect it to be below 70%. And FEV1 in isolation, you'd expect it to be less than 80% of predicted. Um, and again, you do this pre and post bronchodilator, and the appreciation here is you don't see a change, no reversibility. And sometimes you might see a change, and then you begin to suspect asthma with COPD, perhaps, or asthma with COPD overlap syndrome. I think that's a thing, ACOS. Um, and then the second one, the O stands for optimized function. So you look at these non, -pharmac non pharmacological measures as well as non pharmacotherapy. And I haven't cited examples, but those are the drug classes we use. And again, it's a stepwise approach. Um, with non-pharmacological stuff, smoking cessation is very important. Very important. Not only because it is a direct prognosticator for us, but because you can't put someone on domiciliary oxygen therapy if they're smoking. Okay? Um, and then I think P is quite important as well, because things like simple things like having their annual flu vaccine or pneumococcal if they're below 65 years of age. So preventing acute exacerbations by vaccination can be a very important thing. I guess what this is trying to encapsulate is, as a physician is seeing a patient with COPD, try and keep them out of hospital. The more out of hospital they are, the less likely they are to die in the long term. So it's all about, well, not quite primary prevention, is it, but secondary and tertiary. Do as much as you can. You mentioned that you never give that Right, so Mac here, clinical pearl, you never give Lamas alone. I think you meant the drug, but never mind. Develop a plan of care. So GP reviews, self-management plan, and if they're older, end-of-life care as well. You can manage exacerbations. Um, oxygen, you aim for a saturation between 88 and 92%. Don't want to oversaturate them. Why? Yeah, because essentially stop breathing. 
because what's the normal respiratory drive like in a normal person carbon dioxide but in these people because they're they can be severely hypercapnic they, they're more reliant on peripheral oxygen for the respiratory drive and if you give them rapid flow oxygen and you and the body senses that there's lots of oxygen i don't really need to do much they can actually stop breathing so non-invasive ventilation as well if they have these figures again stepwise management read at your own leisure guide to addition of therapies this is TMI, really, too much information unless you're interested. Okay, case okay, three. So you have a 54 year old woman of South Asian extraction. She presents with fever, weight loss, and hemoptysis. What are you thinking? You're not going to ask her any questions, are you? You're just going to say TB. <laughs> like, it's, it's not, I guess the likelihood ratio is very high on a Monash exam, if you get the same. <laughs> Probably like 99%. <laughs> so, in further history taking, she has nine sweats intentional weight loss she was born in india could be sri lanka we had sri lanka last time they're diverse they go everywhere except indigenous australia she's been treated for pneumonia and oh sudden change of gender um and she believes she needs something stronger um, on exam she's febrile and dysnique um bed found her emphoric distant and hollow emphoric in, <laughs> inspiratory and post acid crackles. So she has crackles on inspiration, she has crackles that come on um, after coughing. And the sputum mug, it's ripe with blood streaked sputum. We had an OSCE station last year where there was no sputum mug. <laughs> it was imaginary, but she'd have to ask for it and then he'd tell you what was in it. So don't just look around. Say you're looking around for a sputum mug. What is the most likely problem? You said it, tuberculosis. Uh, likely reactivation given her advanced age and the presentation, which she didn't even bother to clean because she just jumped to a diagnosis. Um, so it's a communicable chronic granulomatous disease caused by a mycobacteria and tuberculosis. Okay, there's other species that can do it as well. Species, subspecies, genus, species. species. Usually in wolves to lungs, but can go anywhere else. So I was just having this discussion with Matt. Um, Sort of drawing parallels between tuberculosis and sarcoidosis. One's a chronic, both both are chronic granulomatous disorders. Except TB gives you caseating granulomas, and sarcoid gives you non-caseating granulomas. And obviously, there's the whole difference in infective etiology versus idiopathic. But that's another point for another discussion. They are also similar because they also seem to be in the lab. You said they were different. No, well, there too bad. Similar. There are some similarities. No backseas. A summary of pathophysiology: things you should know to get bust. AFBs, acid fast bacilli. Someone has AFBs and Zeal Nielsen stain. A golden complex. We believe this is what um, was in our x ray in the same station on our OSCE last year. Um, so you had a Sri Lankan guy who was living in a share house in Sri Lanka. He was here to study. He had like a cough. He was, he was in his 20s, so he wasn't even old. I think you were expected to pick up a golden complex or a runky complex at least. but. So a going complex is, um, so there's a going focus. That's what you see first. Uh, if you look at the picture, there's a black and white arrow. The black arrow and white arrow refer to the calcified peripheral granuloma and the calcified hyalur lymph node. So the calcification happens with um, fibrosis. So it's a, it's a long-term thing to be, able to, pick up, to be able to pick this up on an X-ray, which is what made me a bit skeptical in the first place. But so a gone focus and then a gone complex. A gone complex happens when you have a gone focus, so you have a peripheral granuloma, and then you also have an enlarged hyalur lymph node. So that's, those two together become a gone complex. And with eventual calcification and visibility on X-ray, you call that a runky complex. Again, just get buzzed. Epi and risk factors, it's very, very common. But underthought of as a diagnosis sometimes in Australia, which is why it's really like hammered into you to think about brown people with cough and blood in their cough. Um, one third of the world's population is infected with TB, so it's relatively common. It's estimated to kill 2 million people a year and it still remains in most people with HIV the leading cause of death. Uh, risk factors include traveling to an endemic area, being Aboriginal, although that never tends to be a risk factor in the Monash exam. Uh, crowded living spaces and low socioeconomic status. Are you drug use? Um, and if you're 
a doctor is working with a TB ward, or a nurse is working with TB patients, that's a risk factor as well. Most of you will actually have um, latent disease, presumably. Don't let this care you. Clinical presentation. Um, so general features, we've talked about things like fevers, night sweats, and weight loss. Okay, pulmonary features specifically include things like a cough, hemoptysis, um, upper lobe fibrosis on x-rays. So it's, it, it is like an affinity for the apical areas of the lung with the bacilli. Do you know why that is? Do you know why that is? Mycobacterium tuberculosis is an unoptional so the EQ is high as well. I think I think she needs some recognition for that. A very good clap. Thank you. This is the most awkward lecture ever delivered. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so VQ. So remember VQ up, VQ down. So repeat again for your colleague. So VQ is um, high to the top. So um, there's less oxygen utilization at the top. Um, so the bacteria can use it. Like the perfusion and ventilation are more matched at the bottom. So um, the oxygen is like taken into the blood and then distributed around the body, whereas at the top, perfusion isn't that high. So the um, bacteria can use the oxygen that's ready to be available, but it's not being taken into the body. So you've got bloody soggy lungs at the bottom and dry <laughs> aerated <laughs> lungs at the top. <laughs> <laughs> you've got dry aerated lungs at the top. So the top's a good place to be if you need that oxygen and want to stay away from the blood and potential defense cells. So pulmonary TB can be primary or reactivation, and reactivation disease is also called post-primary disease. Primary TB is often asymptomatic, okay? And the reactivation TB, you can be infectious for two to three years before you're finally diagnosed with it. What's reactivation called? Hmm? What diseases are called? Reactivation? Yeah. <clears throat> That's it. Uh, so extra pulmonary manifestations, because it's a multi-system disease, it's worth knowing some of the common extra pulmonary manifestations, or, well, common in terms of EMQ, but not in real life. You can get lymphadenitis, serositis. So you can get pretty much a serositis, um, inflammation of the pleural membranes, inflammation of the pericardial membranes, inflammation of the peritoneal membranes. Um, POTS disease, anyone know what that is? I think it's specifically referring to tuberculosis of the spine or osteomyelitis as a complication. And there's Addison's disease, and it can also affect the genitourinary tract. And you might see a sterile pyuria where there's a neutrophilia in a urine sample without a detectable cause. Miliary TB is when it goes everywhere, it derives its name from millet seeds, which are the, I think, radiographic findings of miliary TB. It's that bad. It's like lots of millet seeds splayed everywhere. Lymphadenitis, hepatosplenomegaly. So this is really bad stuff when you get to this stage. Organ dysfunction. Anytime you see hepatosplenomegaly, it's generally bad stuff. It's just, you know, clue for life. Organ dysfunction, Addison's disease, choroidal tubercles in the eyes. So if you get neurotuberculosis, you can actually pick it up on an ophthalmoscope. Not that you would in Australia. Hunting for TB. So active and latent TB, different things you can do. Okay, so for active TB, generally you take a sputum sample and do an MCS and get bust when you find AFPs. Um, this sample is usually neutral and gram stain, so you have to do. <laughs> That's quite handy. I, I wouldn't have to do this if I just pressed that. What was that? <laughs> yeah, okay. So latent TB, it's, it's a bit more tricky. So you can do the man through tuberculin skin test or quantifier and gold. So this is quantiferon is just like um, IGRA, pretty much, immunoglobulin reactive assay. Um, does anyone else want to comment on the potential merits and demerits of doing quantiferon versus Mantu? Do you guys know how it's done? Do you guys know how the Mantu is done? It says skin test. What was that? Yeah, so if you, like me, had the BCG vaccine, or if you, not like me, worked on the TV awards, you could get a false positive with a mentor. Or just, you know, um, occupational, just environmental exposure. So if you come from an endemic region, you could test positive. Uh, Quantifer and Gold, I think it's a blood test. 
it's an essay. Also a type 4 hypersensitivity yeah, I know that. Again, type 4 hypersensitivity. That's the sort of stuff Professor Root Salem encourages you guys to know for your pathology exams. He's not joking. I'm not joking. Do I look like I'm joking? <laughs> Yeah, so you get pricked in your skin, and then 48 to 72 hours later, you'll have to look at the induration of the epidermis, I think. And that gives you a semi quantitative assessment of how much, how severe your latent infection is. So, <laughs> why? <laughs> Chest x ray findings, the consolidation. Okay. Remember, it's not a term specific to pneumonia, even though we throw it around all the time. So I just need to get that out. Cavitation, fibrosis, calcification. And the hallmark is the presence of a caseating granuloma, like you see in this beautiful image from Mariopedia. Quick plug. Standard short course therapy. So everyone knows RIPE. RIPE. In third year, what changes does you need to know? Maybe the duration, not as important, but the side effects. Okay, Max says, Max reckons you do, but then. He's probably like, he's aiming for a Z-scale of like seven, so only if you are. So the side effect of rifampicin, orange body fluids, you already know this. But then know the other ones, like pyrazinamide can give you gout, ethambutol can give you optic neuritis, and isoniazid, you always co-administer with B6 because you can get a peripheral neuropathy. Um, here's a nice little algorithm for approaching the patient. So much of what was just said, except in a flow chart. So you have a 66-year-old woman now who presents with acute dyspnea. Not sure. Any thoughts, guys? What do you want to know? When Actually, I think it's my. <laughs> yeah, okay, so <laughs> short of breath. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, she has had a dry cough. Um, chest pain is worse with breathing. How else would you? What other terms used in clinical practice to describe that phenomenon? Pleuritic chest pain. <laughs> <She's landed there. laughs> Even though you didn't bother asking what she's been doing, I'm telling you, because I'm that kind of bosky patient. I'm nice. Um, I've, has had a diagnosis of colorectal cancer. Could be ovarian cancer. Just has a diagnosis of cancer, really. An examination. Also on the OCT. Also. On the <laughs> <laughs> I think Joshua Ahn just said some people are fertile. <laughs> For the record, I'd like that to be preserved. Um, on examination, rails with decreased bed signs, rails with just crackles, a term that's gone out of use. So I'm bringing it back. <laughs> so you do an ECG because why not, right? And you see this. So what do you see? Not that this is your first line investigation. <laughs> okay, why do you say that? Like, what are you seeing? Um, there's either a very significant right axis deviation. There is a significant right axis deviation. We'll stop it there. Okay. Yeah. So what else are you seeing on this? So when you think of, what do you think she has? A PE. A PE. So when you think of a person with a pulmonary embolism, and when you think of ECG findings that are always mentioned in PE, what are you looking for? All right, so do you see it here? You couldn't tell, right? But you know she has a PE, so just say it anyway. Okay, so very uncommon, and you can get this with right ventricular strain. So this is right ventricular strain, right heart pattern. So non-specific for PE per se, but you do expect to see it in a clinical question, right? So you do get an ECG, by the way. I backtrack. You get an ECG. Any person with chest pain do an ECG. You have to exclude a cardiac cause. So the definition in etiology, you have embolic occlusion of the pulmonary arterial system. Much of most emboli come from um, veins of the leg. Relevant pathophysiology, so work has tried, get buzzed again. Um, settled emboli, uh, massive emboli that straddle the bifurcation of the pulmonary trunk. Um, Infarcts are characteristically red-shaped. They're usually peripheral and the apex pointing towards the heart of the lung. If just, just sort of see it on a pathological specimen, you can tell it's a PE. Um, and the real pathophysiology you get in 48, 24 to 48 hours is coagulated necrosis of lung parenchyma and hemorrhage. 
uh, risk factors and clinical assessment. So that's the wells and modified wells criteria for PE, thanks to up to date. Risk factors are things like malignancy, you get a hypercoagulable state. And with that, this is all the pro inflammatory cytokines released. Immobilization, so she's been, you know, maybe just fat people or people who've traveled frequently. Ideally, people who travel frequently with the thrombophilia, like antiphospholipid syndrome <laughs> or factor V Leiden, um, or people who travel a lot and they're pregnant. <laughs> you can't, I'm just thinking, you can't travel a lot within nine months, can you? But never mind. Um, also, things like SLE and OCP use. So, the characteristic presentation is in a woman, given that the majority of these risk factors you can clump into this one female patient. Okay? Um, so, this is just a tool you use in severity assessment. There's also the, for your interest, uh, the PE rule out criteria called the PERC criteria. So if you find they have a low likelihood on the wealth criteria, you can do the PE rule out criteria to sort of almost exclude a diagnosis of PE altogether. So you feel more reassured when you send them home. I haven't put that in, but you can look it up. So this is, you know, you know how you go to Google and you sort of Google pulmonary embolism and or like hepatitis and they come up with these images. <laughs> So I love these images, and generally they're very good, but this is one of the sort of amateur R ones. So what do you see in this image? Number one, it's not a woman, so that's kind of concerning um, for the editors at Google. I think that's a very safe assumption in clinical practice. <laughs> um, what else do you see about this man? He's overweight, and he's sitting on a sofa. Presumably, a history of immobilization. He's just fat because he doesn't move. Um, he, I'm not sure if there's just a lot of makeup, but he looks sweaty, and it seems to be central chest pain. You can't tell if it's pleuritic, but it definitely seems to be rapid onset because he's sweating and everything. There's a sympathetic overdrive component to it, and some would call this tripoding. I think I asked Taha, and he said this is tripoding, but I was like, that's not relevant. But anyway. <laughs> um, so these are your ECG findings, like we said. Uh, chest x-rays are usually normal. You might actually be able to see um, an infarct, and that's the Hampton hump. Um, also these other signs that are very uncommon, one, if you want to look them up. One clinical pearl. Is, is More clinical a, pearls. <laughs> it, buzzed. It, would it be worse if you could feel pleuritic chest pain, or would it be worse if you didn't feel any pain at all? What do you guys think? So Max question is, would it be worse if you have pain or if you don't have much pain? If you have pain? If you don't, she says if you don't have pain. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. According to our PBR yeah. uh, And why is that? Because um, it has to irritate the pleura, so it would be more peripheral, like a more peripheral um, occlusion. If it's more, a more central occlusion, then it blocks off more, uh, more veins. And then, but you don't actually irritate the pleura, so you don't have any pain. So yeah, I think that's the explanation. That's right. So majority of infarcts tend to be peripheral. And peripheral infarcts are good in a sense because they don't really, the more distal they are, the less havoc you're wreaking. So the pain you feel is from pulmonary, um, pulmonary, Jesus, pleural irritation. So for there to be pleural irritation, you expect a distal infarct. If you have a proximal infarct, you actually might get a lot of damage, but no pleural irritation until it's very, very bad. So another clinical pearl. Also in the same stead, um, you're auscultating for a murmur, and you can't hear a loud murmur. Um, this is only relevant in VSDs. Actually, this is not this is not relevant at all. Yeah. So if you have a really loud murmur versus a really soft murmur, which would you be more concerned about? We sort of see in the cardiology revision next year while we're here. This this is only in the in the presence of a VSD. So yeah, usually, yeah. Soft one. You'd be concerned about a softer one. Yeah. Why? So like less resistance to the whole thing. Yeah, so bigger hole, soft murmur, smaller hole, loud murmur. So always think about that paradox in medicine. Maybe, maybe not always, maybe, maybe when it's maybe. necessary. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> um, also, also, I don't want to go back to this. The sudden urge to defecate has featured in five point exams. <laughs> um, and there's a paper published a long, long, long time ago, I think before I was born about how a Valsalva, so increased intra-abdominal pressure, affects blood flow, well, affects central venous return, and hence pulmonary blood flow. So you, you, you're trying to strain to defecate, right? 
and you get decreased venous return. Um, less blood from the lungs. That's good. And then you actually do it. And then there's this release of intraabdominal pressure, this release of pulmonary blood flow, and then you get a dislodgement of enemas. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think that is the reasoning behind Monash questions um, about people dying in the loo. Uh, general principles of management. So this is a really good table. It tells you how long you need to treat someone with anticoagulation for. And really the benchmark of treating someone with a PE is what? What do you look for in your severity assessment? What single most important thing are you concerned about? What feature about them? <coughs> okay, whether they're hemodynamically stable. And if they are, that takes you down a different therapeutic avenue as opposed to whether they're not. Um, I haven't talked much about actual treatments in this lecture, but investigations, do it. Do a CTP or a BQ scan. CTP is a generally gold standard, unless you can't do them because the patient's huge, like a previous gentleman, and you can't logistically get them into a CD scan, or if they're pregnant, or if they have contrast allergy, um, or renal failure. Uh, initial management tends to be the same. If they have pain, treat the pain. If they're short of breath, give them some oxygen. Um, why would you not? What concerns you? Mm. So we hope and pray that you won't encounter a young female with a pulmonary embolus in your clinical practice. But it is really a toss-up. I've seen CDP as being considered for pregnant women. So it's a bit scary. It ultimately depends on how mm, ultimately depends on how unstable they are. D-diamond is a good book. Did you talk about D-diamond? Um, so if, for the per cruel, remember we talked about PE rule out criteria? So if they're scoring all of this low, and if the D-diamond is low, <laughs> <laughs> if the D-diamond is low, you can sort of, because D-diamond is not very sensitive, so you can't, a high D-diamond would be many things, right? Whereas a low D-diamond, we could confidently rule out a pulmonary embolus. That's all I want to get across to you. Um, right. So the cornerstone is unfractionated heparin. So anticoagulation with heparin, low molecular weight, or IV unfractionated. From up to date again, depending on whether they're hemodynamically stable or unstable, you go down different avenues. And notice there are things you can do, like inferior vena cava filters and other surgical sort of interventions, depending on where they are in this flow chart. Won't spend too much time on this, because there's actually a lot to cover. <laughs> We still in case five. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> a sixty-five-year-old woman. Sorry, is this your? <laughs> too bad. Pre oh, yeah. <laughs> presents with a productive cough, rust-colored sputum, and fever of thirty-eight point three, after a week of paralysis symptoms. I don't mind. Do you want to? No. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. As always, if I make any mistakes, please call me out. Um, can't guarantee that everything is right. And um, this is a non-judgment-free zone. So yeah, pl please feel comfortable. Yeah, so what do you think about this woman? What are some questions you would ask? Uh, Uma, what do you think? <laughs> no judgment anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so there's always, the, always everyone just goes straight to the diagnosis, but in an OSCE, it's more important to show that you, you reach some. Um, the diagnosis is only worth one mark, so it's important that you show uh, logical, clinical reason. <laughs> so the key point to consider immunizations, for infection, she has a fever, has she been traveling, you're thinking malaria, sort of TB sort of things. Is she a smoker? Um, well, goodish. Respirate is slightly elevated, looks unwell, and you hear crackles in her right lung. And you see this on the sit down, chest x ray. Um, yeah, so as Uma has mentioned before, this is likely a right lobe pneumonia. Um, what lobe do you think this is out of, out of um, interest? Is it the upper, the middle, or the, the yeah. lower? It could also be upper. Oh, didn't see that coming. Before. Nice. Kevin, Kevin, I think Kevin's got it spot on. Um, I think it's upper lobe. Because a middle lobe would more likely occlude the right heart border, but we'll talk about it a bit later. So very well done. Um, so your pneumonia. Pneumonia actually as a term doesn't always, didn't always used to refer to infection of the lung, but it's become more of a recent fad, I think. Um, so it's more of an inflammation of the lung parenchyma, but nowadays it's always due to a low respiratory tract infection. 
So it's a very common condition, as you guys well know, and there's two types usually, um, community acquired, so outside the hospital or hospital acquired. There's also healthcare associated, but that's not really that relevant. Um, so it's, it's very common and a leading cause of death, especially in the young and the old. Um, very nice picture here, actually. <laughs> so is it, is it recording? The recording is all right, yeah. Yeah, cool. just to make sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> I also a shout out to Mumis and Associated Sponsors for having us. <laughs> <laughs> um, just wanted to get out there. Um, we, we support Mumis and thank you for providing the menu. <laughs> <and the> <laughs> <pizza>. <laughs> yeah, so, so risk factors. Pneumonia really isn't something that healthy people get a lot. So it's usually in the very young or the very old, as I mentioned. So impaired immunity. I'm doing it wrong. It's there. That's not. not. <laughs> yeah, so impaired immunity, um, mucociliary impairment, so smoking or CF or Cartagena syndrome, which, if you don't know, is primary ciliary dysentility. Um, I think it's been mentioned in first year or something. Um, aspiration risks, so impaired swallowing, especially if you have a stroke or you're just, um, you have something um, wrong with your gag reflex. Travel, um, or if you work with animals or something. So post-influenza is also quite common and usually the pathogen is strep pneumonia or staph. And chronic disease, this predisposes you to any condition, I guess. COPD especially, because you have inflammation of the, of the lungs and yeah. So um, common causes of CAP, anyone have any ideas? Strip, cool. Um, any others? There's probably three that you are the most common. Mephilis, good. Uh, one more. One more very common pathogen. So staph. Um, there's also mozzarella, but I really haven't seen many people with that. Um, atypical, not to say that I have great clinical experience, but just from experience. Um, atypical, any causes? So a walking pneumonia. We'll talk about that a bit later, but atypical causes. Clear? Yeah, good. Another one. Macroplasma, yeah, very good. A legionella as well. Um, hospital acquired pneumonia, so you have E. coli. It's usually gut bacteria because it's usually caused by aspiration. And there's also a high risk of multiple drug resistance. Uh, this is a picture I saw off Reddit, R Medicine. And this is this is a yeah, this is quite um it's quite concerning, yeah. Like all resistant. I don't know what you would do in that case. One of the comments was like, oh yeah. Um, assess for end of life care or something. <laughs> but yeah, this is this is a re reality in what we live in right now. And on that somber note, um, let's move on. So this is from um, <laughs> this is from Toronto Notes. Uh, learn this learn this table. At least learn learn the learn the main ones. I think it's, it's, it's good to know, especially for exams. They like you ask you. So the thing uh, I can't complain about. <laughs> <can I? laughs> um, so a lot of modest questions tend to be very specific. So they like like to test you on very specific knowledge, and they want you to know all the organisms as opposed to actually finding, uh, never, actually never mind. Um, so, so, so this is what everyone's been, everyone came to the lecture for, I guess, so buzzwords for pneumonia, because uh, apparently this is important. So presentation of cold inclusions and hemolytic anemia, sort of like a walking pneumonia with flu-like symptoms. So this is an atypical pneumonia. What would the pathogen be most likely? Someone, Stacy, what do you think? Oh, very good. Um, another one, another atypical pneumonia. So it's working with water cooling tanks or air conditioning. Legionella, yeah, very good. So, so the story behind this, uh, we don't have time to do it. Um, so red current like jelly like sputum, alcoholic patient, cavitation in lungs. So the, the sputum is a, is a dead giveaway, as is the alcoholism. Kebsiella, yeah. So th there have definitely been questions when it's been like an alcoholic patient, and it was between Kleb and Strep, and the answer was Kleb, which Maybe it makes sense, but not not to me. Um, how about how about rabbits? Rabbits? <laughs> Just rabbits. Anyone know? Oh, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> I think I think the one they think is Frank Ciala, but once again, it's, it's very obscure. Um, HIV patients, so a very common condition. Not very common, but a, no, it's pretty common. an organism that only occurs in HIV people. Or PJP, yeah. Nemesis Jerevica, or pre previously PCP, but it's PJP now. Exposure to animals or abattoir. Actually, one of my tutors had this condition. He diagnosed it. Yeah, well, no, no, he 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 um he got this when he was working with animals.
Cruz or something. So it's anything, any ideas? So, sir? Oh, that, that would be good but that, with birds. I think that's more with birds, just animals like pigs and cows. I think it's Q fever or Capsula bernetti, but it's very rare nowadays. Immunocompromised, travel history and weight loss. T yeah, TB. How about a CF patient? Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas, yeah. So th this, is, this is a very interesting organism because it can develop multiple colonies in the single lung. Yeah. So they're, they're all resistant to different drugs, which is like weird. Uh, and this one, um, someone mentioned earlier, so psittacosis. Um, as to how, how important this is to know in real life, probably not that important, but for exams, I'd recommend learning these. Just take my word for it. Um, so clinical presentation, you guys probably will know. So there's a typical sort of like the, the pneumonia, you probably suspect it's pneumonia, fevers, rigors, cough, sputum, shortness of breath, it's an elderly patient. Um, there's, and there's also the more mild pneumonia. So 30% of pneumonia is viral and they can present as sort of like atypical cause. So you just have a headache, you have sort of chrysal symptoms, um, myalgia and a fever, but you, you can actually function. It's called walking pneumonia because you can actually go to work and go through a daily life without too much trouble, but you just feel really unwell, but you actually have uh, quite a serious infection. So on examination, consolidation, as Rishura mentioned, isn't specific to pneumonia, but in EMQs it probably is. So consolidation is a replacement of alveoli air with mucus, blood, any, any, anything that's not air. So you get dullness, percussion, you probably learned this all in second year, bronchial breath sounds, crackles, decrease, uh, increased vocal fremitus, decreased chest expansion, and yeah, pleural rub, um, yeah, the usual. So investigation to consider, always do oxygen sats, do vitals, respirate, heart rate, uh, blood pressure, just to see if they're stable or if they're septic. Um, bloods, FBE, UECs, ABGs, uh, cultures, as is the case in all infections, and urinary antigens if you suspect that it's something atypical. Um, not, oh yeah, I forget the topics. So CXR, um, you usually do PA and lateral, and you, you, see, you check the consolidation to see if it's in a low bar pattern or a more of a bronchial interstitial pattern. I think I had a slide earlier on that. You can go through that. An air bronchogram, that's when sort of like there's consolidation and you can see the air in the bronchi very clearly. So yeah, as I mentioned earlier, there's um, in oxygen, you might be um, required to differentiate between different types of sort of um, different areas of low bar consolidation. So right upper lobe, um, you see it's limited by the horizontal fissure below. So it's sort of this line, it's between the upper lobe and um, sort of the middle lobe. And the, the, this is a great picture because it's the middle lobe pneumonia and you can see it occludes the heart border. So you can't really see it here. And then there's the horizontal fissure above it. Right lower lobe. So it doesn't really occlude the heart border because you can see it very well. This is a great picture, by the way. Thanks, shout out to Radiopedia. Um, and you, but you, but you, you can see the obliteration of the hemidiaphragm, um, which is which would make mean it's like a lower lobe pneumonia and a uh, back to anatomy. So, so that's the um, horizontal fissure and that's the oblique fissure. So, um, similar story, except there's no middle lobe, so upper lobe. It includes the uh, left heart border and it can include the lingular. I thought there, there may be some questions on sort of like lingular consolidation and it does include the heart border. And there's the lower lobe pneumonia, which includes the hemidiaphragm. So good to know, I think. Severity, anyone know any scores for pneumonia severity? Uh, curb 65. Yeah, curb 65, except we don't really use that in Australia. Um, we use more of like CORB and smart cop. Um, curb 65 is more American. As I learned through Med Conversations, which is a great podcast. Sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm making all these plugs, but I'm actually not being paid for it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just to make that clear. So, CORB, um, so more than two of these, so confusion, oxygen sats, low oxygen sat, rep, high respirate, and uh, low blood pressure. So, it makes, um, makes sense. It's quite similar to CURB 65, regarding the age. And the smart COP, you can, really not important to know for a third year level, but you can check it out, check it out here. So complications, effusions, sepsis, empyemin, and abscess, and respiratory distress. So I actually didn't know the difference between empyemin and abscess until a while ago, which is a, a pity. But yeah, abscess is like a cavitation in the lungs, and you have like an air fluid level. But empyemin is plus in the pleural space, so it's a pleural effusion with pus, basically. And both of those are quite serious. Well, actually, abscess is less serious because um, it's, it's sort of contained, but empyemin requires immediate therapy. 
So management, this is definitely something you need to know. Um, I did say there was not a lot of conditions in third year where they needed you to know management, but pneumonia is very is one of those that you do need to know. Um, but an ETG is a great resource, so definitely check out ETG if you don't already use ETG. Um, I would recommend it for all things um, sort of antibiotics or infection based or any other disease actually, because you can never go wrong. So I, I use the acronym ABC plus D for empirical antibiotics, which is when you don't know the pathogen. So amoxicillin, usually oral, um, or doxycycline if you suspect atypical. So that's the D is for doxycycline. And for moderate, so you use Benpan and doxycycline. And for severe, you use keftriaxone and zithromycin, um, or Benpan and gentamicin as an alternative. And then you follow up after a while to check with the CXR to see if the disease is cleared. So the CXR is a very good predictor of how severe the pneumonia is. Oh, whoops. Yeah, so um, hospital acquired pneumonia. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> so mild, um, moxiclad, because as we mentioned, hospital acquired pneumonia, usually the pathogen is um, way more multiple drug resistant. So you want to use something that's really strong, um, keftriaxone, and then in the end, use tazacin, which is it's a great drug, apparently. Yeah, and what's this? We talked about this a bit earlier. You know it is? Um, could be, could be. Um, how about if you, you if you ruled out TB? They're not like that. They're not Southeast Asian or they um, an abscess. Yeah, very good. So this is a cavitation with a fluid air fluid level. So there's some that's the pus. So there's three differential diagnoses for a cavitation in the lungs. So TB, as we mentioned, abscess and a lung carcinoma. So lung abscess is um, a fluid filled cavity, and the usual symptoms are swing, uh, swinging fever with foul spelling sputum, clubbing, and hemoptysis. Um, and you manage with antibiotics. So the DDX is TB or cancer. Um, we might not have enough time to go through this, but go through this in your own time. These questions are really good. So case six. A 55-year-old man presents with resting pain in his chest, weight loss, and coughing up frank blood that's been progressing for a month. A very classic vignette for a diagnosis of um, anyone? Lung cancer, yeah. So the key points, 40 pack years, no exercise exposure, does not drink alcohol, no rest and travel. Yeah. And there's a sort of like a perihilar lesion right here. Um, this is probably a very probably a very ex extensive disease compared to the one you would see usually. So lung cancer is a carcinoma of the lung and the most common worldwide, but not in Australia for some reason. In Australia, prostate is a lot more common, common in men, and um, but it is the leading cause of death. Interestingly, lung cancer wasn't really a disease. Like it wasn't even mentioned in case, it was only mentioned in case studies before the advent of tobacco. So um, yeah, smoking really is the major cause. So risk factors for lung cancer, smoking, radiation therapy, environmental factors such as asbestos, which can cause mesothelioma, as you know, um, d silicon dust, radon, metals. But I think, yeah, mostly it's smoking. Um, you'd be very unlikely to get lung cancer in via other means, as this picture illustrates. Um, classification, anyone know the different path, like histopathological types of lung cancer? It's good for a path study. If you guys are doing, so yeah, small cell, good. Any other ones? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, so, so that's very, very, very broadly that is the case. So there's four, adenocarcinoma, small cell, squamous, and large cell. And the most common is adeno. So, and they're all linked with smoking. So adenocarcinoma is the most common. Usually it's a peripheral lesion. That means it's near, not near the center of the lung. The paraneoplastic syndromes, and paraneoplastic syndromes are sort of diseases that come with the cancer or maybe precede the cancer. So something you've always heard about is HPOA, which is clubbing and wrist tenderness. And on histopathology, you have, because sort of, it's an adenocarcinoma, you have mucus producing glands and ducts. So this is the most common cause. Um, small cell is another is a more deadly type of lung cancer because usually it's not excisable due to the dis dissemination of the disease and it's usually the worst outcomes because when it's diagnosed it's usually in its latter stages uh, very, it's got two very famous paraneopathic syndromes one siadh um, which can cause a hyponatremic hypovolemia and lambert eaton mycenae gravis which is a very interesting disease so it's it's the opposite of mycenae gravis which is you know it's a 
uh, like a acetylcholine receptor autoantibodies, as you can see here. Uh, so the more you use your muscle, the more in martinia gravis, the more you use your muscle, the more the weaker you become. But in uh, in Lambert-Eden disease, the antibodies target the vorticated calcium channels, which sort of um, expel the vesicles out in the synaptic gap. So th the more you use your muscles, the more calcium you build up, and the more you're able to sort of move that muscle. So with myasthenia gravis, you get sort of like leg lag and ocular palsies. But with uh, Lambert-Eden disease, it's um, the more you use your muscles, the stronger they become, which is that's the sort of the difference. And um, it's it's very important to know because it can precede the cancer by up to four years. So this is what, this is um, probably something that can be tested. Squamous cell, not super important to know about, but once again, learn about the hyper uh, hypercalcemia due to PTHRP secretion as a perineoplastic syndrome, and learn the histopath, histopath for your PATH exams. Large cell, not important to know about. It's it's probably the worst prognosis because it's not well understood. <clears throat> so clinical presentation, systemic symptoms, cough, dyspnea, um, hemoptysis, uh, the usual stridor. You, you guys know all know about Panko syndrome and why you get a hoarse voice because of laryngeal nerve entrapment. Uh, Pemberton sign, it's an emergency, oncological emergency, and the various perineoplastic syndromes. So on examination, you have clubbing, you have weight loss, cachexia, HPOA, lymphadenopathy, uh, the usual things you'd expect, and pleural effusions. Investigation for lung cancer. So bloods, um, you can check for calcium, LFTs. CXI is, is a very good um, test because you can see the amount of um, the amount of masses and nodules and see if it's a met a metastasis or a primary cause. Um, pleural fluid cytology. So analyze the cells and see if um, they're malignant. And CT is CT and PT are probably the mainstay of investigation. So with PT, you can identify where the lesions are. With CT, you can sort of do a bronchoscope and then excise it. Um, and then, because the definitive diagnosis for all cancers is by tissue. So you need that um, tissue diagnosis. You need that biopsy, I mean. And yeah, this is an interesting HRCT with, um, this guy's got cigarettes and he's got cancer, so don't smoke. Staging is not that important. Um, you can read this in your own time. Treatment, usually it's, as with most cancers, surgical, radio, and chemo. Small cell, there's no real um, role for surgical treatment because it's usually so spread already. And the prognosis is quite poor. As you can tell from the mortality stats, it's quite a, um, quite a you know, fatal disease to have. Um, for uh, palliation, you can have duplorodesis for effusions. A radiotherapy and cough suppression. Yep. What's this? Sorry, that was a mistake. Yeah, I actually just revealed that, so don't worry. So um, by by um, by definition of by rule of Occam's razor, the spelling is correct this time. Um, so if you have lots of lesions in metastatic lesions in an area, usually that's not the primary area because you wouldn't expect uh, multiple primary tumors to pop up in that area. So if you see lots of like liver liver uh, lesions or lots of lung lesions, it's usually um, metastasis from somewhere else. And that's a rule you can learn. How about this? So you can see this is a CT scan. Um, you have the, the right lung here and it looks, looks right. The left lung, like this is, this is greatly thickened. What do you think this, this is? Like this is all very thick. Yeah, it's the pleura. And the pleura is very thickened. What disease could cause this? Yeah, not bad. So asbestosis could cause this. Um, maybe, actually, no. <laughs> um, maybe not. So this would probably be pleural plaques or maybe mesothelioma. Yeah, because asbestosis would more be like in the parenchyma, I think. Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, mesothelioma is always due to asbestos exposure. Um, you take a history, so if they've worked with asbestos before, brake pads, insulators, miners, uh, and the latency period is 30 years. So you, if you guys have done SPC, you probably have come across this. And it's a, it's a terrible prognosis, and you're going to seek legal advice. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, always seek um, compensation if you're your loved one has been diagnosed with mesothelioma. 
Uh, which of these cancers is the most common in smokers? B. Who said B? Oh, good. Yeah. So actually, it's not the. Um, I think squamous is more associated with smoking, but the most common overall is adenocarcinoma. Case seven. We're moving on. To, moving fast, I believe. Ish. All right. Just just two more to go. So. 62-year-old female with a history of congestive heart failure and stage two heart, heart stage two heart failure has three bypasses in the past and presents with a two-week history of worsening dyspnea and chest tightness that has increased on lying down. What do you guys reckon? What would you ask from history at least? No one. Okay. Um, so she's dyspneic, dyspneic, um, lower oxygen sats has. Uh, high respirate and high blood pressure as due to heart failure. So stony dull to percussion, crackles in the area above the level of dullness and out of the JDP. So by now you should probably have an idea of what this could be. And the CXR shows, um, yeah. So marked cardiomegaly and sort of like a meniscus sign. So this is a pleural effusion in this lady um, due to her congestive heart failure. So pleural effusion, um, who wrote this? Okay. Um, so is it really a, is it more of a sign or is it more of a disease? And the answer is it's probably more of a sign. Yeah. Very, very, um, it's usually due to another, um, there's usually another cause for it and it's not usually primary. So it's an excess of fluid in the pleural space classified as transudative or exudative. How do you classify, how do you differentiate between transudative and exudative? Yeah, very good. So you count the protein or the LDH or the cholesterol, um, whichever criteria you use. So a protein concentration of transudates um, is low. Um, yeah, a low protein concentration would mean a transudate and a high protein concentration is exudates. Um, and we'll move on to why that is a bit later. So other causes, other sort of like classifications of pleural effusions, it's not always just fluid. It can be a hemothorax, so a blood. Um, empyema, as we talked about, a calothorax, which is obstruction of the lymphatic system, which can cause a sort of like um, buildup of chyle in the pleural space, and a hemoneumothorax, which is the presence of a pneumothorax as well as a hemothorax. And you get this very strange sort of like straight line sign, which is different from the meniscus sign that you usually see. So this indicates that there's air and fluid in the pleural space. Uh, so pathophysiology of effusions, transudative causes are usually sort of more systemic causes. So cardiac failure, constrictive pericarditis, or fluid overload. Exudative causes are more sort of local causes, so local inflammation or um, just, um, yeah, infection, inflammation, um, so like pneumonia, TB, or local cancer. Um, we'll move on, move on from this. So transudative versus exudate. So in transudate causes, um, the fluid is sort of there's a there's a fluid overload which causes uh, a more dilute sort of serum and so there's a sort of like increased hydrostatic pressure which pu pushes the fluid out of the pleura into uh, out of the uh, blood vessels into the pleura so that would mean that there's that would mean that there is decreased protein concentration do you guys sort of follow why that is yeah sure if i'm not making sense and in exudate causes, it's more of the local factors which cause vasodilation and pushes fluor, um, fluid from the blood vessels into the pleural space. So that's why you can use um, the protein concentration of the pleural fluid to differentiate between um, transudative or exudative causes. Hopefully that makes sense for everyone. And back to Light's criteria. This is Richard Light. Um, Light's criteria is not important to remember exactly. Uh, I remember. We were we were with a physician who didn't really know these. It's gone out of fashion. It's gone out of fashion, yeah. Um, so if at least one of these is true, it's an exudate cause. And you can see why it's not the best, because if you look at two or three, they're pretty much they mean the same thing, right? It's like um plural fluid over serum LDH is greater than 0 0.6, or plural fluid is over two thirds of the upper limit of the normal serum LDH. So one is you take the serum and one is you don't take the serum. So they're kind of um redundancy in that way. I think these days they use more of a free, free test rule. So if the protein is higher than 20, 29 or the cholesterol is higher than this, the LDH is higher than 60%, then you can say it's exudate. Um, other causes, if, if it's lower than that, then you're thinking of more systemic causes. 
So here are some acronyms. Um, I, I don't actually find them to be too useful because if you think of it in more of like a pathophysiological way, it's easier to remember. But these are here for your own learning if you think they're more useful. Uh, so the, for the, if, as a patient with fluor, pleural effusion, you can be you can have a variety of symptoms. So you can be asymptomatic, you can be dyspneic, you can be in complete and utter pain, um, signs of pleural effusion, as we explained, decreased expansion, synodonis, um, this is all basic OSCE stuff. Oh yeah, one more, one thing. So you have bronchial breathing above the level of fusion. Do you guys know why that might be? Any ideas? Jasmine, what do you think? No? <laughs> Sorry to pick on you. Uh, so usually it's because the pleural, the pleural fluid compresses the lung and that sort of constricts sort of the bronchioles. So you get more of a, uh, you get bronchial breathing in that area. Really? I remember. I don't remember that actually. So investigation and treatment, obviously you do, you do the CXR, but sometimes you can't actually see the blunting of the angles. <laughs> yeah, bless you. You can't really see the blunting of the angles until you have 200 mils of fluid, which is quite a lot. It's like one cup of pleural fluid until you can see the um, see it on a chest X-ray, which is not the best, right? But so, so the test that physicians usually do is the ultrasound plus tracheosynthesis. So you learn about this anatomy. You find you find the area of uh, the effusion. You go one to two above it. Um, choose one to two below it. I mean, and infiltrate it with a nickel cane and then attach a needle and then you insert it into the rib. Um, above the upper border, so you can miss the intercostal nerves and veins. And then you take the fluid for pathology and you can find the cause and then you treat the cause. If you do, if it's recurrent, you, you can use um, sort of like bleomycin or talc as a way of pleurodesis. And that sort of fuses the, pleural, the visceral and the parietal pleura together. So you don't get any effusions, but it can negatively impact your ability to exercise or exert yourself. So this is actually from like a vet's page, a veterinary page, but you can appreciate the different types of um, pleural fluid and different etiologies. It's, so animals actually aren't that different. You know? yeah. So um, yeah, th this is not really um, that useful to learn, but more for your own interest. So case eight. This is a man with having trouble maintaining his stamina during his weekly tennis sessions with his mates from the local tennis club. Over the next 10 months, he deteriorates until he is short of breath, even upon walking to his car. So you do an examination. He's got fine crackles, clubbing. He's, he's been a smoker in the past, but doesn't have any connective tissue disease. And he has limited exposure to asbestos, birds, dust or hay. Now, can anyone give me a good diagnosis for this? What do you reckon, Lawrence? Yeah, good, good. <laughs> so this is likely uh, IPF or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And the chest X-ray shows sort of like reticular, what do you call dots in, dots in lines? Reticular modular? Reticular yeah, patterns. So the lung interstitium is between the alveola and alveoli and the capillary endothelium, sort of like the a supportive tissue of the lung. And this disease is characterized by injury and progressive fibrosis of, of the interstitium. So it's actually quite a broad and multi-spectrum disorder, but the ones, yeah, um, but the, okay. <laughs> but the ones that um, you, we expect to know are IPF, uh, just pneumonia, which you talked about, sarcoidosis, hypertensive pneumonitis, and connective tissue disease, and drugs and occupational exposures. And we'll go through that quickly. So the etiology can be very varied and there's quite a lot of causes. So occupational causes, asbestosis, silicosis, coal, cotton, burialosis, yeah, beryllium is an element. Um, drugs, so nitrofurantoin, which is used for some UTIs, um, bleomycin, amiodarone, which is like a heart drug. Uh, bleomycin is like a chemotherapy drug. Infections, TB, fun, uh, fungal infections, viral infections. Granulomatous infections, so like sarcoidosis and hypersensitivity and pneumonitis. And there's also the idiopathic causes. Um, all these rheumatological causes, rheumatological conditions can also cause uh, ILD. So rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, scleroderma especially, and angst Um This 
Differentiating between upper and lower lobe, I wouldn't recommend learning this unless you want to impress your... Yes, no angst bond. Yeah, no angst bond is like upper lobe, I think. Unless you want to really impress your consultant, you can learn this. <laughs> or if you want to impress Indy, you can, you can learn this. Um, IPF, so it's a disease of the elderly or the aging, so around 50 plus, 60s. It's, it's relatively common in Australia and it's a disease it's a disease process of primary fibrosis, hence idiopathic, so which is a disease of itself, which distinguishes it from other ILDs. And it's um, it's quite a terrible disease because it's it's the onset is insidious and it's like just there's no way you can really reverse it. And studies have shown that uh, you know it's been shown that like there's even though smoking is a risk factor, there's no real definitive cause for it. So you never know if you're going to be hit with this. Uh, so risk factors: age, smoking being male and then family history and gore as well has been shown to be slightly linked. And yeah, it's quite terrible. We've seen quite a few patients with this, I think. Um, and yeah, usually they deteriorate or they get lung transplants if they're fortunate enough. Uh, complications, so respiratory failure, type one usually. Um, cardiovascular disease, corporal pulmonale, or, and there's increased risk of lung cancer, which is um, quite bad as well. So the, the features, the only two main features is dyspnea, and it's a progressive dyspnea, and also sort of like a dry cough, weight loss, systemic symptoms, um, as you would expect in any chronic condition. On exam, um, sort of like the valcal strap, the very, the pathognomonic, the very sort of buzzwordy um, EMQ would have fine diabetes, low inspiratory crackles, not because um, IPF usually happens in the lower lobes. And clubbing does occur in late disease, and it's thought to be due to release of increased growth factors. So investigations, lung functions, which show a restrictive picture, uh, you know, a normal ratio, but a reduced FVC, decreased TLCO. You would screen for other causes, and um, sometimes you do need a biopsy, but it can be a clinical diagnosis as well. So on test X-ray, you should have reticular and reticular nodular opacities, and which are known as lines and dots. But the better test to do is a CT or a high resolution CT. And um, you see a ground glass appearance of, this is sort of like the, the fibrosis in its early beginnings. And when it gets to the late stage, you see sort of a honeycombing. You can appreciate that this looks, with the, looks quite like honeycombs. Yeah, so there's no way to reverse the fibrosis and the survival median is quite low. Um, They've been trialing some new drugs. You don't need to know about these, just for interest. And immunosuppression can help, but it's still quite drastic. It's still quite, um, um, it just slows the progression, but doesn't really do anything for it. Definitive treatment is lung transplantation, um, but even that doesn't guarantee a long-term survival. Usually it's sort of like five to 10 years as well. Um, so we've, we've made a few one-page summaries as by request of some conditions which are on the matrix that you do need to know about but aren't that important um not sort of like oscar ball conditions but still good to know about so perhaps it is being pneumonitis is it also a type of ild and it's usually it's it's a reversible ild so it's not as bad as ipf and it's usually due to a uh sort of like a allergic reaction to a substance so there's a lot of a lot of causes of this uh, farmer's lung caused by aspergillus uh, bird fancies lung, uh, cheese workers, this hot tub workers, people who work with isocyanates, and there's like a whole list on Wikipedia, you can look it up. And clinical features is usually acute, so in the acute setting you get fevers, rigors, and the dyspnea, but in the chron chronically you have more weight loss, you have progression to uh, sort of like an IPF picture. Um, but usually but the disease, the prognosis is quite good, because as long as you stay away from the exposure, you'll be fine. So um, you might have to change jobs, which can involve occupational medicine, another interesting topic. And um, in the acute setting, you give O2, and if, if it's worse, then you can get, move on to immunosuppression. But usually it's quite benign and that it can be reversed if you stay away from the substance. A bit like sort of allergic dermatitis away. Sarcoidosis, as Rashuda mentioned earlier, it's a, a normal collection of non caseating granulomas that can form anywhere in the body. Most often the lungs, but it can be in the skin, uh, the sort of like the, the skin GIT tract, uh, sort of, uh, muscles, head and neck as well. 
Um, it's, it's a diagnosis of exclusion because we don't know the cause, but the, the sort of the modest buzzword is that it's very common in African Caribbean people. I'm not sure why, but it's like a 20% higher risk if you're African Caribbean as opposed to Caucasian. Um, similar presentation to sort of other lung fibrosis. And the sort of the, the CXR, the chest X-ray shows a bilateral hyaluronic lymphadenopathy, also known as the Garland one two three sign, and you have increased uh, ACE hypercalcemia because the nodules they release calcium, and um, you do need a biopsy for the definitive diagnosis. I'll show you the X-ray. So this is the Garland one two three sign. You have like two hilar um, nodules, and then what was the middle one called again? Is it like the para peri peritracheal paratracheal paratracheal nodes? Yeah. And the management is usually you um, symptomatic, so use NSAIDs, glucocorticoids can control uh, can can help, um, and then you move on to more severe uh, immunosuppression, and then you treat symptomatically depending on the affected organ. Um, but you don't want to overdose glucose uh, glucocorticoids too much because that can cause other problems. Um, yeah, quite a few patients. There are quite a few patients at, at the Alfred with sarcoidosis, if you are there. So this is the last case. Um, more of a pediatric case, but it's still important in third year. So it's a three-year-old boy with low weight and height for his age. He was born at home <laughs> and did not receive testing post-delivery. Um, he has chronic cough and large amounts of bloody sputum and recurrent respiratory tract infections. What do we reckon? Good, good. <laughs> So coarse crackles, because he has bronchitis. Um, parents complain of steatorrhea, hyperglycemia, or all, all, all the all the all the buzzwords. And on the sex side, you see this very um very diffuse opacities, and you can kind of see some tram tracking. Maybe not too well. But. So cystic fibrosis. Um I, I recommend learning the spiel because it's it's very because cystic fibrosis is the most common genetic condition. Um in, in Australia at least, and it's an autosomal recessive condition. So it's one in 25 carriers and one in 2,500. So not that uncommon. Maybe like in the university cohort, you would have say like two or three. And it's due to a mutation of a Delta F508, the most common mutation of the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator gene on chromosome seven. Um, I have listed this because I've been asked this a lot and I always forget it, but I'll recommend learning, it, learning this, especially for some OSCEs and four fears. It's good for four fears as well. So it's a multi systemic disorder. Um, if you have the PBL on it, you'll remember that it affects um, ciliary function. So you, you have inability to expel the mucus from your from your lungs, and also inability to sort of um, sort of excrete the hormones from your exocrine pancreas, which can cause the pancreatic disease, and also inability of the intestines to sort of pass their um, to pass stools so and also abnormal sweet gland function so the features um, it's a multi-system disorder so it can affect all systems uh, a lot of systems I mean so respiratory um, exocrine pancreas are the two most common but also intestines um, the pedibillary system um, can affect uh, sexual can affect sexual function and can also cause sort of like osteoporosis and just um, generally generally patients will be of lower weight and height because they're using so much energy just to to breathe and function um to test to test with ccf you do a guthrie hill prick test at birth and you're testing for irt or immunoreactive trip, trypsinogen above the 99th percentile if positive you then move on to a gene test and a two mutations is usually diagnostic and if you only have one mutation, you move on to a sweat test. And the sweat test tests for um, chlorine of higher than um, 80 in, in the sweat test. So usually you give them something to make them sweat and uh, you do the sweat test. And if, if the chlorine is high, then it's usually positive. If it's negative, then there might be a carrier. So um, you do lung function test. Usually it's obstructive picture. Um, bloods, might, if, they're infection, if, if they're infected, you might consider some blood cultures. Um, but for the CX, for the chest X-ray, you usually because of the uh, sort of the recurrent infections and uh, muc purulent mucus, you get thickened bronchial walls and tram tracking on CXR, which is basically um, the bronchitis is when the bronchi are permanently dilated, 
So you'll see them more clearly, and it looks like tram tracks because of the walls are so thick and plugged with mucus. And the CT will show signet ring shadows. So signet rings are sort of like just rings when it's like um, it's got like a thing here. And um, so you, you can sort of appreciate these uh, lesions as signet ring shadows. Yeah, but learn these for exams. Uh, management, you might be asked about the synoscopies because it's not unreasonable. Um, if not third year, definitely fourth year. So lifestyle management, um, respiratory management, you give them chest physio, um, antibiotics, prophylactically, mucolytics, bronchodilators, treat them for pseudomonas if they, if they have it. Uh, gastro symptoms, you have to give them uh, vitamin A, D, E, K because they're sort of fat, um, they're fat soluble and your pancreatic enzymes are lacking. So you can't really digest fat that well. Um, treat their diabetes because their pancreas will be affected. And long term, the survival rates, uh, eventually they will need a transplant of some sort. Um, if you haven't mentioned off one description, do you want to mention it? No? Oh, actually later. So we mentioned bronchiectasis a bit late, earlier. So usually it's due to CF or just chronic infection due to pneumonia or maybe a, a cancer. So it's re irreversible dilation of small to medium sized bronchioles. And you have cough with lots of sputum, more than a cut and lots of blood with it. Uh, also you get clubbing and you get recurrent infection. You, know, you have infections and a wheeze. So we mentioned the CT and the CXR a bit earlier. And you, you gotta protect them against more infections, so vaccinations are very important in CF and in bronchiectasis, and antibiotics are important. Uh, one thing someone mentioned earlier was that bronchiectasis was very is very common in the Aboriginal community. So um, if it's an Aboriginal patient, maybe it's something to consider. I'll just put that there, actually. Yeah, this is more of the <coughs> chest X-ray on the, the CT um, signs. So sleep apnea. I think this might be the last one. So unexplained daytime sleepiness and five obstructed breathing events per hour of sleep, which is quite a lot due to relaxing of the muscle tone at the back of the throat during REM sleep. So this is usually, as you can imagine, the patient would be sort of obese truck driver. They, they uh, fall asleep at the wheel and they crash. Um, this would be this is what would happen in the mono CMQ. But realistically, this is a very, it's a very common issue in, in many cases. And it's very, especially important if, they're going under GA for a surgery because that can mean that the airway is harder to secure. Uh, you know, under GA, the muscles are even more relaxed, and sometimes you give muscle rela relaxant, which um, sort of makes that worse. So obesity, shortened jaw, and hypothyroidism, but probably most likely, most often obesity. So gasping or choking during sleep, um, pausing during sleep, tiredness during the day, dry mouth and waking because they use their mouth to breathe a lot of the time, and snoring. So you really, you really do a sleep study in the slide, but you can differentiate between obstructive sleep apnea and central sleep apnea by the sleep study. With central sleep apnea, you'll get sort of um, no airflow, but also you won't get the neural impulse to try and breathe. But with obstructive sleep apnea, you, you get um, no airflow through through the um, airways, but you do have a drive of the brain to try and to try and breathe, which is why they wake up and gasp for air. So management, lifestyle, uh, weight loss, diet, exercise, sleep on the side, good sleep hygiene, avoid alcohol, and maybe consider another career because driving might be dangerous. Sleeping pills can help, but the definitive treat treatment is usually CPAP or BiPAP. It's one of those masks that people wear, and it can help with just positive pressure. It can help push the air into the lungs. And there's also some devices that you can wear and ultimately this surgery by your local Maxfax surgeon or was it ENT? I'm not sure. Yeah, so OSA. I think, okay, I promise this is, this is, I promise this is the last one. So acute bronchitis, this is a green condition on your matrix. Um, is it still a green condition on the matrix? Um, it shouldn't really be because it's, 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 um, it's not something that <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's not something that is often tested. Um, so McFarlane criteria dictates is it acute illness of less than 21 days. Usually you have a cough, at least one other low respiratory tract symptoms, such as sputum or wheezing or chest pain. And there's no other explanation for the symptoms. So especially just a viral infection of the bronchi. To put it lightly, usually it's after an ERTI. So maybe you have an upper respiratory tract infection and that gets into your lungs and you get 
the usual chiral symptoms as well as cough, a dyspnea, hemoptysis sometimes, and a wheeze and bronchial breathing. So usually you don't need to do any investigations. It's a clinical diagnosis and the treatment is quite self-explanatory. It's, it's a virus, so you don't give antibiotics. You can give NSAIDs if they have complaints about their fever, but um, usually it resolves by itself. Um, do you want to mention about alpha-1 antitrypsin? All right, as, so as a very, very, very quickly. Very quickly. Um, what is your understanding of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency? Symptoms? Someone just said this. <laughs> Symptoms? Shortness of breath? Anything else? So emphysema in a patient with evidence of cirrhosis. Okay, so duo in a pathology exam question. What about pathology or pathophysiology? Why do we get the emphysema and the cirrhosis? Elastase. So there's a deficiency of nutrition from elastase, which is actually what blocks elastin, and then elastin breaks on collagenous matrix, both in lungs and liver. Um, and then a similar note, another common condition, person presenting with hemoptysis and hematuria. What are you thinking? Yes, very correct. <laughs> what, what kind of vasculitis? Hemoptysis and hematuria in an exam question. Close. Good posture syndrome. So anti-GBM disease. Antibodies to both the glomerular basement membrane and alveolar basement membrane. Okay. So just as a condition we didn't really put into slides, but thought we should mention in passing. Yeah. All right. So I think that's it. Unless Mac wants to thank everyone again. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had some questions from Said. I think this, these questions are really good. Obviously, we can't. Uh, these are not our questions, so shout out to Syed and Syed. So shout out to Syed and Syed. It's a, it's a great book. <laughs> so thanks for up to date. Yeah. Uh, BMJ best practice. Up to handbook. Right, come on, come on. Come ETD. On. ETD. Um, yeah. Also our sponsors again. Um, Toronto Notes. Radiopedia is great. Uh, Life in the Fast Lane. All our tutors, and lecturers, parents, colleagues. Rohit Sharma is a great guy. And uh, yeah, Mumis and Kevin Shea here. Thanks, thanks, Kevin. All right, thank you guys. Have fun. This guy. Yeah. Where? Huh? Where are you going? We'll see. We'll see. Just go. No, you're going to have a plan, you know? You're going to have a management plan. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> you're going to so, be mad with a plan. You know what? I need a few. You know the last book when you were smoking? Is that what you meant? Or like, is that related to that? Oh, yeah. This is related. So, so yeah, what are you saying? This is so, so, so trip, uh, oh, trypsin. Okay. Trypsin is elastase is a trypsin. Oh. Yeah, so elastase breaks down this. And then antitrypsin, oh, alpha-1 antitrypsin oh, blocks yeah. elastase. So it stops it breaking down the LVL rate. So if you have the frequency of <laughs> antitrypsin, it means yeah. that you have more elastase, which will break down your... Um, <laughs> so not deficiency. So it's not a deficiency. So like, it's not Oh, yeah. Yeah. Should I stop sharing? Yeah, go. And if you go back to Graham, you can just go stop. It was good. It was a good refresh.